It shows that we're live, brother. Now, it'll take a second to for people to start uh, filtering in and watching. That see, I got my lovely assistant hitting refresh on her screens to see when it starts. So give us just half a second. You bet. All right, it shows me live on YouTube. And it shows me, let's see how we look on Rumble. Let me hit the little refresh. We're live. We're live on both, brother. Lieutenant Colonel Matthew Lohmeyer, former Lieutenant Colonel. To people who aren't familiar with your story, they're about to be blown away. Um, I've had the pleasure of meeting you a couple times now. And as a former uh, serviceman, I couldn't be more proud of you. Uh, when we met, I was going to tell you that, but I didn't want to make it awkward. But you are the definition of a leader who chose to do the hard right instead of the easy wrong. And so I'd like to basically start this off with you sharing who you are, what happened. I, I have no doubt that there's some people watching this that are familiar with your story, but I bet you most people have not heard of it. It's a story that is growing. It's been going on for a couple of years now, um, but it's pretty wild. And you have this unbelievably important insight into a number of different topics. So to anyone not familiar with Lieutenant Colonel Matthew Lohmeyer, who or prior, because you've been out since September of 2001, um, but you were a commander in the United States Space Force. You're a prior U.S. Air Force fighter pilot, as well as trainer. Uh, you flew the F-15, which is one of the most sophisticated, fastest jets out there. That's the that's the big guy that they give to the top pilots, if we're being honest. Because what, it goes, what, three, 400 miles an hour faster than like an F-16? What's the numbers on that? In every way, the F-15 is better than the F-16. Yeah, we're going to get into that. And uh, of course, whenever somebody is talking to somebody if they were to talk to somebody from the united states space force i'm inclined to think that the one of the first questions they're going to going to want to ask is related to ufos uaps and aliens so we're definitely going to get into that to everyone watching we are streaming simultaneously right now on rumble and on youtube and in a half hour or 45 minutes or so we'll jump over to rumble that's a you know and let me just say this real quick if you guys are wondering or people watching like why won't i just stay on youtube Rumble is promoting my contact uh, content, unlike YouTube. I'm very happy with YouTube. YouTube's been very good to me. But to just let me just say this real quick, and I want to give you the stage because you have a lot to say. Um, I have like 1.6 million followers on YouTube, and my last live stream got 100,000. Whereas on Rumble, I have 80,000, and I have almost 300,000 views. They put my content on the front page. You go to rumble.com and they blast it. So to anyone listening. The link down below in the description, you'll, that's all you'll have to hit once we leave YouTube to go over to Rumble to finish our, our conversation. And basically, that's what I'm, I'm telling you is that we're going to get into the aliens over on Rumble. But right now, we'll start off here. So without further ado, Matt, uh, will you please tell us basically a little bit about your background and your story? Um, and I'm, I'm sure everyone's going to be fascinated with what they're about to hear. Well, Jimmy, my wife and I are subscribers to your Bright Insights YouTube channel, have been for a long time, and um, I was just as happy to meet you in person as you were me. Um, we've learned a lot and have interest in the things that you've been talking about for a long time, even though it seems a little bit out of the uh, purview of a Space Force or an Air Force officer, it's all fascinating nonetheless, and um, so thanks for all of your work. Um, I was just in the Nashville, Tennessee airport um, two days ago, and as I was waiting to board my flight, I sat next to a woman uh, who wanted to strike up a conversation with me, and as I chatted with her, she asked uh, what I did for a living, and that inevitably led to a conversation about my military career, and when you mention to anyone that you were in the Space Force, they look at you kind of funny. Uh, like they don't know what you're talking about. And I suspect um, that your listener audience is a bit more astute than your average American citizen. Uh, nevertheless, I'll start there and just say that there is a branch of the military called the United States Space Force. It uh, is, an, in fact, written into Title 10 of the U.S. Code as of December 2019. It's an official branch of the military. It's the first time that we created a branch of the military since 1947 uh, when we last stood up a branch of the military, which is the U.S. Space Force. I'm sorry, the U.S. Air Force. Um, when I finished flying jets in 2013, I came to 
uh, the U.S. Air Force Space Command. And in the Air Force Space Command, uh, we do um, space-related missions such as GPS, space-based missile warning, strategic communications, and whatnot. And when the new branch of the military, the Space Force, stood up, we essentially did an organizational restructure, uh, renamed a bunch of units, but all of those missions that the Air Force once did in and through and from space, the newest uh, branch of the military, the Space Force, also uh, took responsibility for and just continued doing those same old missions that we had always done in the Air Force. Um, and so uh, what, whatever little uh, knows about what the Air Force did in space, the Space Force is also doing uh, those things. That said, there are new missions that our newest branch of the military is doing that the American people haven't yet heard about. Uh, new, new units have been stood up. Uh, some of my, my peers that I know well were placed in charge of units to do missions that are still highly classified and that I'm sure in the five and ten years ahead uh, they'll learn more about publicly. But uh, yeah, you've, you've summed up my background. I spent over 15 years in the Department of the Air Force, uh, in both of those services, flew jets. I was a T-38 instructor pilot as well, and uh, grew up in Tucson, Arizona, right nearby where you live. Um, don't know right. if that's knowledge or not, but uh, so, yeah, that's uh, a high-level overview of my background. Now, I'm going to go ahead and flatter you and, and, and drop, you know, do the whole name-dropping thing. You have met Elon Musk. You, get, you briefed him. You've also briefed then-President Trump. Um, and a lot of people should understand that, you know, what happened to you in the military is you're about to get into, you were, and I'll go ahead and say it, you're, you're marked for general. Like you got taken in under an assistant, under a general directly. Correct. And that's something I did. That I was people that they're essentially going to well, train. Yeah, I was, I was an aide de camp, uh, is what it's called for the four-star general who was in charge of air force space command and then became the first chief of space operations, which is a member of the joint chiefs and who is the four-star general in charge of the space force. I see. Now you started let me clarify something, Jimmy. Let me just say, so a lot of people that follow me are aware that I was enlisted and I had deployed to Iraq. I had volunteered. I was very patriotic after nine 11. Uh, I was a senior in high school when nine 11 happened. So I was profoundly affected. I went into a recruiter's office shortly thereafter end up having a few knee surgeries and it held me back. And finally in 2006, I enlisted and volunteered to go to Iraq. And finally I was placed in a unit that eventually got there in 2009. And what I know being in the military is that there is no place like genders don't matter. Your first name doesn't even matter. You are, it's business. It's a very professional setting. And so you started observing, um, protocol that deviated away from that when you share just be blunt share what you started observing happening involving the your time in service whether it's we're going to dive into marxism we're going to dive into crt and gender and everything else um share what you observed well we've got a lot to talk about i think uh, and this is just one topic of many um mm -hmm. I'll try and share high level thoughts. If you want me to go deeper, then feel free to interject and um, ask more. Um, I went to the DOD's premier strategy school in 2019 to get a master's degree in military strategy. We studied a lot of history, uh, war theory, the history of the Cold War, and I became somewhat enamored during the year that I was there with the history of Marxist revolutions and communism. And um, I uh, came out of that school into command in the Space Force in the summer of 2020, and that was at Buckley Air Force Base, now Buckley Space Force Base, outside of uh, Denver, Colorado. And after I arrived there in command, I uh, immediately recognized that there was a totalitarian spirit afoot on the base because we had a, a left-wing activist base commander who, wittingly or not, had adopted into his, um, into his daily walk a Marxist narrative of human events and of the history of the United States. Uh, he had adopted the New York Times 1619 project as his view of history, which he wanted to help educate 
all of our base service members about. And so he was trying to disabuse us of the idea that the country, in fact, had a founding in 1776 and wanted to inform us instead that our country's uh, founding began with the instantiation of, of, of slavery in the United States. But the, the reason I bring all of that up is because I recognized at once that a lot of his talking points were all about a narrative of an oppressor, and his narrative was race-based. It was an oppressor who was white and an oppressed who was black, and that the white-black divide, the oppressor versus the oppressed narrative that Marx so well uh, outlines in part one of the Communist Manifesto, uh, what was was something that was really important to him as a uh, radical political activist base commander that he inject into the base culture to help help I guess re-educate all of us uh, and it's not just Air Force personnel or Space Force personnel that were at that base there's Navy personnel and Army personnel and other three-letter agencies at Buckley doing space missions and so that's my first encounter with what I saw as political activism uh, from senior ranks May I ask you really quick? This this commander was a white dude, correct? No, no, he was a he was a black man. Okay, uh, and I'll tell you uh, to your point. Um, your first name didn't even matter in the military for the yeah. entire time you were serving in the in the uniform that I was serving in uniform. Um, certainly, your political views didn't matter. Uh, your race didn't matter, and it didn't matter ever if you had a white commander leading black airmen or you had a black commander leading white airmen that wasn't something that people cared about because you expected a talented thoughtful leader to help you understand your mission in a broader context that was maybe geopolitical maybe it was there are certain political aims to which your mission was attached and it was all in defense of the nation and the constitution and the american right. ideal our way of life our freedoms and um, that had all, almost it with a bang after George Floyd's death, gone out the window. And the same activism that you saw spreading across the United States on the nightly news was the kind of activism that was coming from my base commander. And I recognized it at once as unacceptable behavior for someone who is in uniform. And right. so I took on the... It was a slow realization. It was months in the making, but I realized that this is this is unacceptable enough that it requires feedback. It requires a formal written complaint to the Space Force Inspector General's office. It required talking to members of the Joint Chiefs, my old boss included. Uh, President Trump, uh, shortly after I began this conversation in September of 2020, issued an executive order banning the teaching of critical race theory and, and the banning of diversity and inclusion trainings in the military. And um, that stopped all of the political activism writ large throughout the Defense Department, with the exception of a few small pockets, I suppose. And one of those, fortunately and unfortunately, was my base at Buckley. I had a guy who couldn't help himself. Uh, I also had an activist oh. cha chaplain who did his bidding and who couldn't help himself but denigrate the United States and the white man, which was totally unacceptable. So, so that to led clarify, to a bunch of things. So just to clarify, these leaders were knowingly and purposely disobeying an order from the president of the United States, the commander in chief, by knowingly yes. and purposely. Okay. Yes, but craftily, they, uh, they proceeded with their indoctrination so as to be able to deny that they were wittingly uh, or purposefully indoctrinating and subversing a, an entire base population. If you were to ask my base commander, you know, does he believe in Marxism? He'd probably scratch his head and say, I'm not sure what you mean by that. And he genuinely might not have. But um, that's one of the reasons I thereafter wrote a book trying to help educate the, uh, hey, I was just reading it too, by the way, before we uh, jumped on this call, because uh, I forgot People what I wrote in there. It you weren't kidding. Like people uh, have resoundingly in the reviews called this the best description of Marxism that they've ever heard, and it matters more now than ever. Most people don't actually know what Marxism is. 
uh, they, they're like, well, communism, what's this, what's that? Mm. Will you explain that? And yep. then, and then we'll get into like what happened to you after you wrote this, but would you give the, the listener right now, explain to us exactly what Marxism is and how we're mm. seeing it in our lives and how we've seen it as well as throughout history and how, you know, that it's reemerging. You know, it's so, t- it's so tough to, um, I kind of really dislike, um, mainstream media the big the big news shows because if i'm asked to go on there i get 60 seconds to describe right. things and so i very much better appreciate a podcast like yours where i can i can take a little bit of time at least but that, that's why things like this questions like this do require a book sometimes is because it's difficult for someone who's never grappled with these ideas to in an instant start to absorb them but i'm going to try and be as succinct and real and true as possible so that uh, hopefully it's helpful for someone who's not thought through this before. Communism predates Karl Marx. Okay. Communism and a communist league asked Karl Marx if he would pen a declaration or a manifesto for them that would state articulately their views And Karl Marx uh, published what is now known as the Communist Manifesto, what what we all recognize and have heard of as the Communist Manifesto, a century and a half ago with the help of Friedrich Engels. And it has four parts in it. And in those four parts of the Communist Manifesto, Marx wrote his young, bright ideas down about how he best thought it was possible to incite the working class in his day to a violent revolution against the bourgeoisie. He divided up his narrative of human events into two groups, an oppressor class. This is all in part one of the Communist Manifesto and an oppressed class. That was respectively the bourgeoisie and the proletariat. And he gave the proletariat sufficient reason in the manifesto that they needed to unite as workers and, if necessary, violently throw off their oppressor, the modern capitalist. Okay, so as a starting place, and I, and if someone wants to look into this more, I've d- described it fairly well, I think, in part two of my book, Irresistible Revolution. It's, it's in part two where you can go, I go through in detail all four parts of Marx's Communist Manifesto. But the difference between Marxism, which is an ideology, it's a thought about communism and about violent revolution and about the oppressor versus the oppressed classes, and communism is just that. It's the, it, Marxism is the thought of Karl Marx about socialism, communism, and it's about economy. Yes, it is, but it's also a much broader view of, of human events that I've already described as the oppressor versus the oppressed. Communism is a form of government where the government has seized all control of, um, of, uh, of economy, uh, uh, the means of production, and is, um, is something, there's liter- literally a thousand videos available, or there's 10,000 videos available um, on, on, on communism and communist countries that you can go look at after this. But Marxism is the thought of the man, Karl Marx. The apologist for Marxism will want to tell you, well, it's really all about economy. And Karl Marx admittedly wrote a lot about economies. He wrote a little bit about it in Communist Manifesto, but he wrote a lot about it in Das Kapital mm-hmm. and elsewhere. And one of the things that I saw when I began to study Marxism, the ideology that was permeating all of the countries across the globe in the late 19th century and surely throughout all of the Cold War was that there was an emphasis on pitting one class or group of people for whatever reason. Early on in the 19th century, mid to late 19th century, is about economic class stratification. Later, it was usurped, and today it has been usurped to be about race relations and an oppressor class versus an oppressed group or or class of people. Because... It, the spirit of it all is the same, but the narrative has been adopted to our modern circumstances in the United States because it's the best narrative of human events that can be leveraged to create anger and hatred sufficient to, to get people to unite together in violence against the other, the evil other. Okay, That is, the, that is what I want to emphasize about this. Mm-hmm. So as a starting point, I'll say that is Marxist ideology or Marxist thought. 
the the idea in the end is that it brings about a revolution that will allow for a communist state to be uh, established the first successful revolution by the way that led to a successful establishment of a communist state was the bolshevik revolution uh th that was a little over one century ago now in russia and uh within like two years or three years there were over a hundred communist parties established in countries across the globe to include our very own united states it was like 1919 or 1920 that we had a communist party usa that wasn't exceptionally popular but uh, it was active and it became popular. So the purpose of this is what's the underlying purpose? It's not that these people want to uh, give jobs to people and make things equal. Isn't it about the people at the very top that just want to dominate and control? Isn't that what the, all this woke culture is ultimately about? Isn't that what it is? Is that the people at the top don't actually believe in it? They don't practice it. They're the biggest hypocrites on planet Earth. Uh, what's their, why do they do it? Well, that's, it's a tough question. Um, because the nuance matters and uh, there's no one size fits all answer, but I want to reemphasize something you said in your question and it's that woke ism and Marx ism and postmodern ism and feminism and LGBTQ ism and all of the isms and the causes and the, and the social justice affairs in which humanity has been involved for decades now, uh, black pride, I mean, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not meaning to give offense to anyone, but at this point, I don't really care because all of these isms are really connected to the spirit of Marxism, which in my book I try to show was the spirit that animated the Illuminati in the century prior to Marx with Adam Weishaupt and others leading up to, I mean, Adam Weishaupt, I think, dies in 1830, perhaps, and it's the same year that Karl Marx is... Uh, I might get that wrong, 1820, 1830. But I mean, they barely, they, they almost overlap. And I think it's most appropriate, frankly, to take the spirit of the ideology all the way back to the beginning of recorded history. You can see it show up in a Genesis account, whether you view it as a literal history or mythology, of Cain and Abel. You've got, you've got an adversarial spirit whispering in a man's ear you've been dealt with unjustly you've been treated wrongfully your brother has taken something that rightly belongs to you in this case the birthright and if you use violence you can take what rightly belongs to you that's the spirit of cain and i think that that same spirit that emotional visceral response and anger and hatred to your brother that the enemy has whispered in your your ear that, that shows up there in Genesis is the very same spirit that's been used to topple regimes throughout history. And it has different names and it wears different masks and Marxism wears different masks, goes by different names. Um, and I don't care if it's the black lives matter movement in 2015 and 2018 and then 2020, um, the, the impulse of anger that leads to violence because you've been dealt with unjustly, that uh, a bunch of homies wearing wife beaters in the streets of Chicago exhibit when they're smashing windows and tearing down and burning down society is the very same spirit that's been since the beginning. I want to be clear about that. And understanding that, I thought, man, you can never do this narrative justice unless you like lay it out a little bit in a book, right? And so... Right. Uh, with a bit of a chip on my shoulder and begrudgingly, I, I put pen to paper trying to describe this a little bit in a book as best I could and pointing people to other sources. Um, and I think it, I think I did a pretty good job and I think it's led to at very least a bit more of a national dialogue about what we're suffering in the uniform services as a consequence of this kind of rhetoric about the evils of America. Now, don't get me wrong. I want to be clear too. Like, I mean, I just went to the, uh, the black Hills and went to see Mount Rushmore for the first time in my life, like six months ago. And on paper, I've always thought, man, that's like American exceptionalism. And I got there and it really bugged me. I looked at the chiseled out mountain and I thought, well, that's pretty disrespectful. And I don't think George Washington and Thomas Jefferson would have, uh, is Jefferson up there? <laughs> I know Washington I is Abe Lincoln, Teddy, Teddy, Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, but, you know, like I looked at those guys and I thought, 
I don't think Washington would have wanted his face carved on the Native American uh, Black Hills Sacred Mountain, mm -hmm. right? And so, like, I'm very real about the evils of empire. Um, and the United States uh, suffers from the evils of statecraft like any other empire in human history. I'm staring at my volumes of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire in front of me. I mean, yes, that's a very real part of the unfolding history and, and of human drama. But America's ideals are great. Uh, American exceptionalism is rooted in the ideas and ideal, ideals that our founders tried to ensure in the form of a declaration of independence and in a constitution. It's for those ideas and ideals that we fought the Civil War, I think. And it's for those ideas and ideals that you had the great oratory of a Martin Luther King Jr., or other champions, real champions of civil liberties. And we undo all of that when fools rush in trying to solve problems that have already been solved and are adamant that, um, that we're just so evil that we must be toppled. And so we topple statues, we burn cities, and we um, destroy buildings. And I'll tell you what, and then I'll stop, but you, what, what I saw in command in a unit in the Space Force was a base commander who was parroting Marxist narratives of American history. And I saw young people who were 18 and 19 and 20 and 21 getting on their Twitter accounts and on their, you know, what's the highly compromised, maybe, well, they're all compromised, TikTok, getting on their TikTok accounts or Instagram accounts. And they were pushing this narrative out because that's what they saw others doing. And they just wanted to retweet and they wanted to send out a TikTok video. And so when you have young men and women who have signed up to serve their country, but are also in their free time parroting Black Lives Matter and saying that they hope that Detroit burns to the ground or Baltimore burns to the ground, first off, they should be court-martialed and kicked out of the service, but they weren't and they were protected and so I knew instantly we'd created a sufficient cultural problem for ourselves that unless it was undone quickly, we'd likely see the disincentivization of a massive amount of Americans from service in their, in their military, which we have. And we'd run into terrible retention problems, too. We'd, what we'd see people leaving the military do you services. Believe, We've seen that. Do you believe that's intentional? Like I look at everything the military is doing. It's almost like they're trying to make people not want to join. Like all my fellow veterans everyone's confused like people are you know people right. i served with which has now been 13 years ago since i've been out of the service or 11 years ago since i've been out excuse me um everyone's like looking around like what's happening it's almost like they're trying to level out the the united states military to become such a a weak force that we will not be able to defend ourselves let, let me ask you this let me just be point blank do you believe that we have been infiltrated do you believe the united states has been infiltrated and you believe that um and if so, why? And what's the uh, where's this heading? Let's get okay. let's get into this. What what's real? What yeah. do you think is happening? So you have all this experience. You wrote a book about this. They relieved you of your command. Um, you're essentially fired, is what they did to you. You exposed mm -hmm. they're doing drag time story hour on base, correct? Yeah, drag time story hour um, is permissible, but not someone who's an enemy of Marxism, apparently. And uh, you know, right. the, here's the height of irony. The amount of blood and treasure that the, this country spent to combat communism and to contain Marxist thought during the Cold War, a half century of fighting, the Korean and Vietnam Wars are the ones people mostly pay attention to because it's the only ones the United States have a, had a really involved participation in. But there were wars fought with Marxists in countries all over the world during the same time frame. And it's over at the beginning of the 90s. And it's like the, the great beast of communism is behind us, so we think, and we're sitting high and mighty as the global hegemon, and we think all is well and we're comfortable. And our enemy's actively working in the universities, of course. They had been for a long time. But also in the United States military, the answer to your question is yes, we've been infiltrated at every in every institution at the highest levels of government. That's been demonstrated. It's not just a theory. It's been demonstrated that we've been 
infiltrated. However, so that's the simple answer, but I really squirm a little bit when I'm the one. I like listening to simple answers sometimes, but I want to be careful with what I say. I don't think that everyone who participates in the revolutionary fervor is a witting, avowed Marxist. I don't They're believe just impressionable and going and fitting in, right? Isn't that what a lot of people do? They go after the young ones because, like, more than anything, kids just want to fit right. in. Young, impressionable adults, I should call them kids. Like, even people in their very early 20s are still kids in my mind because they're still figuring themselves out. And I think that one thing, if anyone has noticed anything the last few years, is that more than anything, people just they don't want to be ridiculed. A lot of people know that things are they're messed afraid. up right now, and a lot of people won't speak up out of fear of just having their friends be like, What are you, conspiracy theorists, bro? Huh? Right. Stuff like that. Well, I saw um, you take you took heat recently. Uh, you asked some question on Twitter like a couple of weeks ago about Hitler. Yeah. And uh, now you're a Nazi all of a sudden, right? I yeah. Mean, so to like anyone listening, like, so I recently went to Baalbek, Lebanon, just a month ago, actually. And I'm making a video on it. It's going to be spectacular. I have pictures of the Trilithon stones, the largest stones ever cut, carved, moved, and, and stacked in human history. Uh, total mystery. It's my, in my mind, it is arguably the best example of a lost ancient civilization that there is and i'm going to present so um and what's interesting is at this site which is quite mysterious by the way there was uh rose granite that was brought all the way from aswan egypt over to lebanon at the site of Baalbek, and that's like 800 miles as the bird flies and not only that they would have had to move these stones that were tens of tons for the columns the pieces of the columns and they brought up a mountain like the, the Lebanese, the Lebanon, Mount Lebanon, excuse me, uh, the Lebanon mountains is an average height of uh, 6,000 feet, but the peaks stop at over 10,000 feet. And they brought them up there. Um, it's a real mystery. Um, but anyways, at this spectacular site, there are numerous swastikas. Now, this is before the swastika and it went by a number of different names. Uh, it's argued it originated in ancient India, but there's, you know, it's been found all over the world. In fact, the Native Americans have that same symbol, the Hopi Indians of Arizona and other uh, uh, tribes as well. Um, I'm making a video on that. So what I asked was, because I found it incredibly interesting that Hitler, let me just say it, I got to say it, fuck Hitler. Like if I could go back in time, I would have been the one that shot him. Like I literally volunteered to go to Iraq because I thought that liberating, liberating the Iraqi people was like the, you know, get rid of Saddam and his sons. And like, you're, here's a modern day Hitler. So like, I, I feel like I shouldn't even have to say that, but like nowadays you kind of almost got to mm. preface it. Like I would shoot Hitler if I could. Um, but before I would have done that, I would have wanted to get some answers out of him as to why he was unbelievably fascinated with ancient civilizations. Why did he and the Reich put in enormous resources into looking for the, um, uh, the Ark of the Covenant, the Holy Grail, even Thor's hammer. This is, people should read about this. This isn't, this, Indiana Jones, those movies were based off of historical events and that the Nazis were actually looking for these artifacts. And I want to know why, because out of how evil the Nazis were, they were unbelievably sophisticated, arguably the, the most educated country on earth at that time. They invented the jet, uh, the, the jet engine. They created the Volkswagen bug. They created the microphone. They were, this was an unbelievably sophisticated civilization. And I want to know why they were so interested in archeology. span Um, and anyway, so I made some posts on Twitter showing literally the swastika, even though it's not the swastika, in front of, you know, these at these temples. And I was asking, I was like, why did Hitler and the Nazis know something about lost ancient civilizations that we don't? And then all these academics came after me and be like, you're a Nazi, you're pushing Nazis. And I'm like, what are you talking about? I'm like, I'm asking a question here of historical significance. Um, but that's the world we live in now. You can't you can't talk about anything without having people. I make videos talking about the pyramids and, and people tell me that I'm denying Egyptian history. It's like, you can't ask questions anymore, but um, I didn't mean to cut you off there, but people need no, to hey. hear this. Like this. I recently went through this and to be honest, I'm just a fighter. Like I, I don't care as much as some people would. And I kind of thrive when people are coming after me a little bit. And especially when you know that you're in the right, I'm like me asking why was Hitler right. looking for the Ark of the Covenant? That's a legitimate question. Let's well, focus it, on the Ark of the Covenant it's, for a minute. Um, uh, it's legitimate. So Not with you. But. Yeah. Well, it's a legitimate question. It's fascinating to me as well. Frankly, uh, you know, we talk about these ugly things like Marxism, but I'd rather go watch your next video on uh, what you found in Lebanon. Yeah, yeah. That's Baalbek, Lebanon. Um, I'm telling you, I had made a video on this uh, a few years ago now, so now it's time to redo it. And I'm so grateful that I went out there, especially the timing of it, because now we're seeing what's happening in the world. Um, you have Hezbollah. So 
in Baalbek, it's run by Hezbollah. They, they're the government. They they run the show. You have to go through checkpoints. Um, we took special precautions to go. And um, I'm so grateful I got out there when I did because the way, you know, Hezbollah is talking about going into Israel, there's all kinds of crazy things going on. So I'm unbelievably fortunate at the timing of it. Um, but this, let's get into some juicy stuff here. Um, okay, so you're with the Space Force. Let me just ask you this because like, let me just be a nerd for a second. Um, so you flew the F-4 or excuse me, the F-15 and you went on to train people in the F-1. So the F-15 is the big boy. And I like I'm an airplane nerd. Um, I, I'm really into jets. A lot of people aren't aware that I used to take flight lessons and I was going to be a commercial airline pilot. And then I ended up deciding to do a rock instead. And um, it ended up not being the, the profession for me. Like I had a buddy that went down the commercial airline route and it just I realized quickly it's like they take all the fun out of flying. Like it's just a, it's a freaking job. And in for years you start out doing the crummy flights, but anyways, that F fifteen. So what's the fastest you've ever been? Do you know? Yeah. Okay, I'm going to answer that. I want to answer. I want to make one other comment. Um, Please. I I'm still stuck on what you said a minute ago about. I, I just I'm thinking about how easy it is for people online to criticize your curiosity and the questions that you'd ask. Uh, you know, YouTube, for example, um, is quick to remove a video that makes any reference to Hitler as if like you have to have some official history channel or something where you're doing a, a really careful academic deep dive. If you want your content to remain on uh, YouTube, I wouldn't be surprised if I, I, I talked about on one of my old podcast episodes. I only did my podcast for like four months uh, about the Nazis for a few minutes and and th that episode was removed uh from youtube the real nazis in spirit uh today are those who seem to be screaming there's like this inner totalitarian that's screaming to get out and they're the first to accuse and ridicule and shame you for being curious about world history uh, they're the they're the people sitting in the halls of congress right now who want to shame israel for defending itself against the brutal attacks of hamas that i mean there, 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 there are people oh, that sorry, are, I didn't mean to cut you off. It's uh, that, that's okay. But there, those are, that, that that's the Nazi spirit. Um, it's the totalitarian spirit and Nazism and communism um, are, are both evils. And we should be able to talk about those things and be curious about those things. So, uh, but uh, over Mach 1 is the fastest I've gone in an F-15. It's a supersonic aircraft. Uh, it's, not, not it's Mach 2? Uh, you haven't hit, won't that hit Mach 2? No, I never hit Mach 2. Uh, you'd be in a dangerous spot if you hit Mach 2 in an F-15. But oh, okay. su the Super Cruise that's available on like the the, the F-22 means that you're able to break the sound barrier without putting your aircraft uh, into afterburner. Uh, F-15s and the other 4th Gen fighters uh, require you to tap afterburner to break the sound barrier. And so... Uh, if you're either running away or to a fight and you need to lob uh, the uh, AMRAMs downrange, then you'll fly a supersonic flight profile at a certain angle of attack and launch your missiles. And then you'll you'll turn and, and run away. And that's about the only times you'll be an afterburner unless you're in a close engagement dogfight. Uh, to be clear, I didn't see combat in those envelopes, but you train every single day in those envelopes. And so you become very familiar with them. And uh, you know what the speed of sound sounds like when you break the speed of sound in an F-15? Absolutely nothing. Right. Just like it's you like and no me sitting here. One... Yeah, it's it's no different. You see the you see your uh, your 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 instruments um, jump and bounce a little bit momentarily. Oh really? Um, when you you know the loudest uh, part of the flight envelope in an f-15 is when you're at corner velocity at high g uh and there are certain diagrams that we reference that tell you exactly uh what air speeds to fly at what altitudes uh and certain uh, under certain g load and uh if you're flying at corner velocity pulling g in the f-15 it sounds like the roar of a lion and you can hear I that bet. inside the cockpit it's awesome i bet it's wild um, is, yeah. I just saw a comment. Someone's asking about the TR3B. So here's the deal. We're 40 minutes in. At this time, we're going to move this over to Rumble, and I want to jump into the big questions. I'm going to ask you about the TR3B first. I'm going to ask you, have you ever seen a... You, don't answer right now. Don't even nod. 
uh, everyone, the link is in the description. It's on Rumble. It's it's streaming for Rumble. It's streaming there simultaneously right now. We're going to move it over there. We're going to get into the the real juicy questions. I'm going to ask about UFOs. I'm going to ask if you've ever seen anything. I'm going to ask if you believe that the government is hiding anything. I'm going to I also want to ask you. Well, I got a number of questions I want to ask you, the most provocative things of all. So at this time, we're going to move this over to Rumble. So hey, everybody on YouTube, hit the link right down there in the description. Um, for those of you who aren't coming with us, although you should, because we're going to get into the good stuff, go on Amazon and buy Irresistible Revolution. Support Matt. Like the one of the points I was getting at earlier when I was mentioning that he was earmarked for a general, they make like almost twenty thousand dollars a month. Like like or like, I don't know, like sixteen, seventeen thousand. Last I saw base pay, that doesn't include housing and the the G ride and like everything else. Like these guys, like this is like a really uh a comfortable lifestyle in retirement and you and you gave all that up you knew what you, was happening when you did it you you knew that by calling out these people it was gonna come back at you and you sacrificed everything and like i said you did the hard right instead of the easy wrong so i want people to realize like there are a few people in this world that are willing to stand up and do the right thing and speak out like more than anything people need to speak out when they see something wrong and you're the guy that did it and i deeply respect that and so i'd encourage other people uh to support you in your cause and i know there's other things you can't get into but there's movies and other things being worked on to help get this story out. Um, but at this time, I'm going to hit end on the YouTube live stream. Everyone just hit the link in the description for Rumble. It's streaming there simultaneously. So at this time, we'll see you on over there. Hang on one second. Do, 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 do.